Okay, Chair and members, we're now live. Um, thank you very much and good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to this virtual meeting of the Joint Staff Consultative Committee that's being conducted with members, officers uh, and representatives at various locations, communicating via audio, video and online. Before the meeting starts, I'd like to invite the committee member and scrutiny officer, William Edwards, to explain how proceedings will work and to confirm that members and officers are in attendance. William. Uh, when I call your name, please can you indicate your attendance to confirm that the required members, officers and representatives are present, can hear and be heard. Um, I will start with our councillors. Standing apologies from Councillor Kate Hart, uh, Councillor Kate Aspenwall. I'm here, yep. Yeah. Terry Hone. Present. Councillor Keith Hoskins. Yep, yeah, here. Thank you. And Councillor Claire Strong is not with us. Um, Councillor Martin Steers Hanscom. Present. Uh, could you let me know who you're substituting for? I'm substituting for Kate Howard. Kate Howard, fantastic. Um, our Unison representatives, we have apologies from Debbie Eland. Keith Fitzpatrick Matthews. Yeah, yes. Thank you. And D Levitt? Yes. Thank you. Um, our SCF reps are otherwise absent, but Matthew Hepburn is joining us and is helping with IT at the moment. And in terms of officers, we have Ian Cooper. Yes, here. And Joe Kers Kershishian. Yes, I'm here. And I see our managing director, Anthony Roche, who's also present. Yeah, I've popped in. Hello there. Thank you very much. Um, extracts from the remote and partly remote meetings protocol are included with the agenda and the full version is available on the council's website which includes information regarding live streaming noise interference the rules of debate voting and part two items members are requested to ensure that they are familiar with the protocol are there any questions before we start the meeting in that case i will now hand over to kate aspenwall the chair to continue Thank you, uh, William. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Chair, just to sorry. say, Councillor Strong has now arrived. Ah, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Chair? Can we just check uh, Councillor Strong's audio and uh, video? Councilor I'm here. Strong, really. I am Thank here you. and are starting my camera. There you go. Wonderful. Very welcome, Councillor Strong. Um, thank you, William, for that. Uh, the item one is apologies for absence. William has very, uh, very ably run through those. Thank you for that. Um, just to put them on record, Councillor Kay Tart, Debbie Eland from Unison, and the SCF reps, Andrew Betts, Christina Corr, Leah Ellis, and Emma Jellis. I have all issued their apologies. Um, item number two is notification of other business, and there is no other business to be taken uh, this morning. So item three then is chair's announcements. Uh, there are three. Uh, this meeting is being audio recorded as well as filmed and the audio recordings will be available to view on mod.gov and the film recording by the NHDC YouTube channel. Uh, members are reminded to make declarations of interest before an item. The detailed reminder about this and speaking rights is set out under chair's announcements on the agenda. And the last announcement is regarding the extended Christmas closure period from 24th to 4th of January. I just wanted to make sure that um, uh, that we kind of noted that at this meeting to say that uh, it's been it's been a year, <laughs> and and I sincerely hope that everybody uh, will be taking a very very good break over Christmas. It uh, it looks to be uh, an even more challenging and interesting January. And so, uh, yeah, I hope that everybody is uh, is able to take that good break and be with their family and, uh, uh, yeah, enjoy that. Yes, Keith, how can you'd like to speak? Hey, I just mentioned that the North Harts Museum is going to be open during the Christmas period. We're open on the Sunday, the, tu the Tuesday and the Wednesday. Um, but we're probably the only part of the council that will actually be open that time thank you thank you for that keith and i think uh, yeah so some people will not be having a break but it will give the rest of us something lovely to do over that period as well so thank you very much okay i'm going to move on to item four just bear with me because my tablet is playing around um and that's the approval of minutes 
So since the beginning of March, when we started to hold meetings remotely, we've been unable to approve the minutes of meetings, mostly because we haven't been able to get in, in to see each other and, and sign things in front of people. We're now able to approve these minutes with the electronic signature of the chair being applied following approval. So we now at this meeting have got three sets of minutes to agree and they are the 18th of December 2019, the 11th of March 2020 and the 23rd of September 2020. I do believe that we've looked at them um, in each meeting, but it, this is the only, this is the first opportunity to formally approve them. So are, are there any questions and comments uh, on, on all three, uh, and are there a slew of questions and comments that would work, that would warrant us taking them individually? Just raise your hand if anyone's got anything to say. Okay, I've got absolutely nothing coming in, so I'm going to uh, presume that you're all very happy to approve, um, to approve those minutes. So I'd like to propose that we take as read and approve as a true record the minutes of the meetings of well, it says cabinet, but it doesn't mean that, of this committee held on those dates. Can I have a seconder? Happy to second, Chair. Thank you, Martin. Okay, we've now just... Right, point of order, Chairman. I don't think that, Martin, you attended those three meetings, did you? I attended at least one of them. Um, I'm, I'm happy to happy defer to, to you, Terry, if, you're, if you'd no, like no, to I second. I was thinking that if that minutes were meeting and you were at, at the meeting. I, it, it, I, I, I withdraw my seconding. I think you're a much better position to well, do it. Only because I attended those meetings. So that's, that's all. fine. Absolutely fine with me. And I can confirm it that, that what was said happened at those minutes. Sorry, Kate, to be pedantic, but. All right. Rules go. Yeah. All right. Thank you. So the seconder is, is Terry Hone. Uh, we just move to the vote then. If you, if you are happy to approve those, if you could put the green tick. If you're not happy, put the red cross. Um, and. If you want to abstain, just raise your hand. I'm abstaining because I can't remember if I was at all those meetings or not. Thank you, Claire. William, are you happy with that? Uh, thank you, Chair. That's carried. Wonderful. So I now authorise the committee member and scrutiny officer to apply my electronic signature and initials to the approved minutes. And thank you for saving me that very long job of <laughs> signing every single page. Um, okay, so now we move to uh, the staff consultation forum, SCF, and we're to receive the minutes of the SCF held in October 2020 and November 2020. Ian Cooper, I think you're going to present this one. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, it's October, November. Uh, a deadline for this meeting is a bit too soon to get the December ones to you. So just those two months, you'll pick up December at your next meeting. Uh, so just do a brief pointing out a couple of things on each of the two of them, uh, rather than going for all of it. Um, so you'll note on the October one, um, following the comments from this meeting last time, uh, we did move the time of the meeting slightly with permission of the members of SCF so that our managing director, Anthony, could attend. Um, and he has therefore attended uh, November and December since then, and he's been very much welcomed at the meeting. Um, and there was also reference in there to IT equipment, which I know we got raised last time uh, at this meeting um, around kind of the provision of uh, laptops in future to enable meetings like this to take place for all staff. Um, that is now subject to a decision from Cabinet last night, going to be referred on to Council um, to uh, put in place the uh, the capital money for that um, so that should enable the procurement of more laptops and therefore more facilities um, to at work more flexibly for staff uh, I think it was received quite positively by uh, the SCF meeting um, and obviously we'll trust Vic uh, to find us the uh, right laptops or equipment uh, to enable us to work most effectively um, subject to that decision by full council uh, in January uh, moving on to November, um, there's a sort of a reference in there to the service impacts of the uh, November period of national restrictions and where that affected things like the museum, etc. Um, at the end there, you'll notice there's a sort of reference to this meeting. Um, probably could have been, I suppose, minuted slightly better. Uh, it wasn't trying to pick on this meeting and trying to get rid of you as a meeting. It was just trying to understand the role of SCF versus this meeting and also incorporating the fact now we have a Shaping Our Future steering group, which has member representatives on it, just trying to sort of tie all those together and finding a place for each one. 
Um, so that's the that was the um, explanation of why that's on there in, in the way it is. It wasn't trying to get rid of you because obviously this is a, a meeting that's in the constitution and I hope valued by you as members and obviously also gives the public a chance to sort of listen in if they want to, to see what's going on as well. So I mean, it's, got, it's definitely got a place, uh, just making sure that we kind of link it in all together with all the various meetings that are going on. Um, I'm just going to stop there in terms of my coverage, but obviously happy to sort of delve into any areas you want to from those minutes. Okay, so I think just, just to be clear, the bit that you were referring to there was, oh, now that started to send an email. <laughs> uh, page 13 and, it, and it's point eight, I think is what you were saying there, point, the, the Joint Staff Consult Consultation Committee. The question was, is it still, are we still beneficial as what's covered during those meetings and it's covered through various um, other forums? And the answer was it is considered useful for members. So, um, uh, yeah, I think there was an action there. Uh, could you just let us know, Ian, what happened with the action? Um, so it was uh, yourself to speak to Joe about the need for both. Was that was the outcome of that simply that, yes, it's constitutional, we have both? Yeah, and we've had that to STF in December, that, yeah, the, the reason for the meeting and went into more detail about it. So I think we have covered off the action in terms of why it's there. Um, whether there's a strategy need for GICC, we haven't quite got to the bottom of, but we want it anyway, so that's why it's there. I think, I think, um, so, and I see that Terry's got his hand up and possibly on this, but I think I, I would like to go back um, and, and ask what value they would like to see from us as a committee, because I think we're always happy to be shaped as a, as a group and in terms of what we can do to be, to perform that critical friend role. Um, and, and to kind of have, have the oversight. So I think it's certainly valuable that we get to see these minutes and see that, see that people are having their say and, and what, the, what the kind of temperature check is, but it would be good if, to understand what, you know, what, what that group would like to see from us. Uh, Terry, you've got your hand up. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. It really just a, a question, perhaps somebody can answer, around uh, the purchase of uh, laptops or tablets in that um, I learned from other places that that there's a, there's a supply issue because of, of demand uh, for very for good reasons. Things like we're doing today, where so the demand for tablets and laptops has, has gone really uh, over the really gone up, really zoomed up, and therefore they are in short supply. Have we noticed anything when our purchasing arrangements, or are we having any problems with acquisition of tablets and laptops for our staff? I don't know the exact answer. I think we've will be okay, but that's part of the reason for bringing it to council in, in January, rather than waiting for the budget, the usual budget meeting in February, so we can get ahead, so we can start procuring them a bit sooner to make sure we can get them to start as soon as we can. Obviously, if we, if we face the supply issues, we'll have to try to address that, but the quicker we start, the quicker we'll get them in place. Yeah, I, I think there are supply issues, and yeah, just fair warning, if, we're not, if we haven't got any, I'm pleased to hear that. I hate to think that staff not being able to communicate or attain whatever they're supposed to attain, because of lack of hardware, which would be no fault of ours, but because of supply and demand. Thank you. Uh, Anthony Roche, can you have your hand up? Um, thank you. Yeah, just to follow on from that last point, we certainly did have problems uh, earlier in the year when we first went out to try to get uh, laptops for both staff and councillors. There were supply issues at that point both in terms of how long it took for them to arrive and then the fact that they arrived, they arrived with, I think it was Egyptian keyboards on, something like that. So there were supply issues earlier in the year. Um, as Ian said, the reason for bringing forward the uh, request for approval is to try to give us sort of um, the greatest uh, opportunity to, to um, now get more in. Thank you. Uh, Clestron. Thank you, Chairman. Um, firstly, I think it was me that commented about the when the meetings were being held, and I say I was very pleased to see that you've moved your meetings so that Anthony could uh, attend them. So I think that was a good decision by the committee. Uh, secondly, I note on page 12 on the NHDC update, it says Howard Crompton will be discussing the transformation programme with the staff briefing on the 5th of November. I wonder if there was any feedback from that. Um, Don't all rush. I think it was 
Well, it's a very positive meeting. Uh, got a lot of input um, from the staff. Uh, I think everyone kind of received the benefits of the transformation. Has some great ideas. Um, I think it can be followed up by um, Howard attending uh, team meetings to kind of go into more detail, and we use that to come up with a, I guess, a long list of projects to look at for the transformation team. Uh, obviously you have to do them in some kind of order so once he's got that long list he'll start to work out where the greatest benefit will come uh, but certainly very positive engagement and some really good input into what Howard needs. Excellent um, Anthony and will we get to see that on this committee or where would where would it sort of turn up in the um, you, you know as, as a for councillors to get a, an overview of I mean I love it when we hear sort of positive feedback we get lots of good ideas from the employees but sometimes it's just getting that message out so the councillors, we also get to hear that. Um, if I perhaps pick up on that point, um, I didn't have anything to add to Ian's uh, comments in relation to the, the staff briefing, it was really positive. Um, but in terms of where members will, will see an input, um, so starting point is obviously Howard will be reporting to the relevant executive members, um, but the transformation work stream is also part of shaping our future. So the shaping our future steering group is probably where it will come through. Um, and then, of course, there's the potential for scrutiny for ask for reports and updates and that sort of thing as well. So there will certainly be um, opportunities there for members to, to see what's going on. Lovely, thank you. And Anthony, did you uh, did you enjoy uh, being able to attend? Yeah, it's good. And and literally the only reason, and I always used to attend um, when I was deputy chief exec, I always used to attend as well. Um, it was literally because we have a, a weekly uh, COVID catch up amongst the chief execs and um, it clashed with that, the long and the short of it. So grateful for SCF for moving by half an hour, which then gives me the flexibility to get there. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, OK, any more questions or comments on that? None. Okay. Uh, let me just see what we need to do with this one. Bear with me. Um, I think we just need to receive them. So no votes necessary um, on that. And I'm not getting anyone saying no. Okay, wonderful. Uh, so people strategy update in Cooper over to you again. Thank you, Chair. Again, I'll just pick out some of the key themes that I, that I think are most relevant. Uh, so at the start of it, it mentions the people recovery plan. Uh, that's got been replaced by the COVID recovery plan um, and that's getting close to being finalised. Uh, it's a combination of lessons we can learn to improve things as a result of what we've experienced over the last year and how we can sort of adapt to the new new ways of doing things to, to you know, overcome the uh, limitations that we're putting our, put our way um, and we'll share that with our leadership team before we kind of look towards finalising that but I think there's some really positive things we can take out of it and hopefully we can we should be able to share that with you at the next meeting uh, so you can look at that in more detail um in terms of the ninety-five thousand pound exit pay cap that's still evolving um still waiting for um the pension rules to change to match the statutory rules um and we're trying to do our best to keep staff informed um but there's only so much information we can give because we don't know the answers yet. Um, and as I noted in the report, you know, it's still subject to legal challenge. So it could change again. So I think it's just a case where we're doing what we can to support staff. Um, and at the moment, there's no sign of any restructures that will affect anyone that would be impacted by the cap. So that's positive in terms of not trying to give staff advice when it's actually you know, immediately relevant to them. Uh, and then also to sort of flag the dotted throughout the report um, are the continued work the HR team have been doing to try and support working at home and the impacts of, of COVID-19, um, be that through um, sort of the welfare emails through to the work by the learning employee engagement team around sort of supporting managers and staff with, with how to operate in the home working environment. I uh, appreciate there's much more in the report, but I don't want to read it out fully. Um, so happy to, again, delve into any areas you want to look at. Thanks, Ian. Um, I think there's a lot in there, isn't there, to, to, that, that's really, really powerful and positive. Um, I noted that the, uh, that the HR team had done, done a, a very extensive job of, of making sure that every member of uh, every colleague got a welfare call. Um, and 
and that managers were then sent emails on, on how to handle things. And I noted in the joint in the previous item that there, there had not been an increase in kind of stress related well being issues. And I just wondered if you wanted to comment on that, Joe, in, in terms of do, do you put it, you know, that, do you think this might be something that we'll see later on? Or uh, is this something that is still on your agenda as a concern? Um, or do you think actually that the work that, that went on over the last year is, is attributed is what's is what's attributed to that? positive kind of outcome of 2020? Well, I, th I think I think we were able, when we ran, when we ran the, the welfare calls in April and May, we picked up on some kind of key issues where people were, I suppose it was more of a shock to the system. Um, initially, was it for people to be in a, a lockdown situation? It was all um, very new. Um, and there were some um, quite concerning issues that a couple of the team picked up on and were able to support staff. I think as we've gone further down the line, we have seen some long term absence. I think I've made reference to it in the report um, where we have had some stress related absences or mental health issues and things that have turned into long term absences. But I think probably not significantly more than usual. Um, so, yeah, I, I think we, we, we're given the support that we can. People, we're, we're seeing that people are accessing the, um, the employee assistance um, programme a bit more often. We've seen some usage, an increase in usage figures, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, but overall, I think, you know, I think that the, you know, generally staff are quite positive about the support that they're receiving and that, you know, we obviously encouraging managers to support their teams, but also to teams to, uh, to, to support each other, to speak colleagues and, and for everybody to look out for each other, really, because we're, we're all in it together, aren't we? Mm. Okay, thank you, Joe. I think um, just a note on that, that that's, that's a, 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 one of the things that we could call a success, I think, out of 2020, isn't it? That, that, uh, that no significant upturn, even though uh, increased usage of the EAP, that in itself is, is very positive because it means that people know about it and are comfortable to use it. So, yeah, I think that's really good. Well done. Um, uh, Anthony, did you want to talk on that point or could I go to Claire first? You did. OK, Anthony. Uh, yeah, if I could just follow on from what Joe said, um, as a leadership team, we're really very conscious of this and at every opportunity, and again, in the staff briefing, we did it yesterday. We're encouraging, encouraging people to take leave and to look after each other and to ask for help if they need to. One of the things I've got at the back of my mind is whilst people might be all right at the moment, there could be easily be another six months or so of this. And actually, the longer it goes on, the greater the chance of burnout for some. Um, and at different times, different departments have been under incredible stress. Uh, fortunately, that has tended to move around so that that has then enabled them a chance to recover. So initially, for example, IT were under huge pressure, but they're back to business as usual. Currently, it's environmental health that are under huge pressure with everything that's going on. Um, and I just wanted to, to mention, because it, it wasn't referred to in here, uh, from the new year onwards, we're taking half a day each month where we're going to close the office to um, for the purposes of learning and development. But the reason for mentioning it in this context is the first session that we're doing, which is uh, Friday the 8th, January in the morning. Uh, we're doing um, a half day on well-being because uh, we thought that that was um, obviously vital at the current time. Give us another opportunity to push those messages. Um, obviously agreed it with the leader and deputy leader um, that we'd be able to turn the phones off whilst that obviously me we, we will obviously still be available for urgent uh, crisis calls and care line will still be open for example um, but it means the vast majority of staff are able to step away from work for that half day uh, and they can really focus on initially well-being and we've got plans in mind for future sessions looking at different aspects of learning and development using some of the shaping our future themes uh, and really sort of reinforcing the importance of that um, so it will be a combination of um, teams and in individual learning teams doing things uh, we will also put on wider council-wide uh, activities none of it's going to be too prescriptive uh, and we'll, we'll sort of see how it goes and, and sort of uh, also shape what those sessions will be used for, depending on feedback from the staff. Very positive. Thank you, Anthony. Um, Claire. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, I know, I know we've, we've spoken about, you know, employee wellbeing in, in previous meetings, and I think very pleased to see that that's, you know, a constant theme that was that, that's going through. However, 
the point I wanted to raise was actually on page 17 and it's flu vaccinations because flu vaccinations are actually available to the over 50s, not the over 55s. And I didn't know whether or not, just, just I don't, again, I don't know whether, because with your voucher schemes, whether or not actually you'd, um, if you'd sort of realised there was an error in the report and also if there were any of those in the 50s to 55s who had been excluded but now could be included. So the vaccination scheme is open to all and as yep. a 43 year old I was a beneficiary of it for example so it's open to all but what we did say to staff was if you are eligible to the for the free one through the NHS um, you don't need to ask for a voucher from us because obviously we have to pay for it. Um, but uh, it was a way of sort of helping staff um, because ordinarily I would not have been able to get hold of one, for example. Um, so, um, yeah, we were able to in do that. We do it every single year. Um, normally we get, <clears throat> excuse me, normally we get someone to come into the DCO to, to give the, the jabs, uh, whereas this year obviously that wasn't possible, so we gave the vouchers instead. Um, and uh, as we can see in the report, had a really good take up of it compared to previous years. And I think particularly, that, and again, because it's it's still ongoing, flu vaccinations. And of course, there is a recommendation that those that should, could and should have it, because it is, they like, like to think that it'd be a good precursor to getting the COVID vaccine. So I'm having mine on Thursday. Wonderful. I have mine last week. <laughs> I can confirm it's all fine, um, but I'm not over 50, in case you're wondering. Um, right, unless there are any other questions or comments, uh, I don't think we need to do anything other than this than to, to kind of read through it and, and talk on it. So uh, we can move straight on to the apprenticeships update, which is something that we have asked. Uh, thank you for providing that. And Joe, you're going to talk us through the apprenticeships update. Joe's just getting a little bit glitchy. Okay. Um, so I was just going to pick out some of the key points, really. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Yeah, sorry. I thought that was a little bit of a glitch then. Um, yeah, so I mean, first first of all, we are um, obviously very proud of the, um, the, the, the scheme. We've been running it for a number of years now. And, it's, you know, it's a great opportunity for young people from North Hertfordshire to um, start a, their career, um, whether that's a sort of the splash a full, first full-time job and we also know that managers appreciate having um, the benefits of um, having an apprentice in their team as well. As the schemes um, progressed we've, um, we've had sort of quite a lot of demand for apprentices and periodically the, um, the leadership team will allocate the places um, to those service areas asking um, and sort of this dependent on um, the priority needs really. Um, we've given the details of um key details of, as a reminder of the scheme and um, so young people join the scheme on um, a fixed term contract of 18 months that allows them to complete an MVQ um, level three or a qualification level three, level three um, often in business administration but we run a couple of other more specialist ones um, this is fun, all funded from a central budget um, the hourly rate that we pay um, is £9.34 currently which is above the national living wage um, in terms of numbers, we've, um, we've totted up about approximately 50 apprentices that started since the programme began in, um, in 2013. And, um, you know, many of them do stay, for it, stay with us for a while. There's some examples there of um, people that are still with us um, after a number of years. Some stay for a short time on a, a temporary contract or move into another area. Um, but it's great to sort of help the, um, the age profile of the organisation as well. The apprenticeship levy, it can be used for um, qualifications for existing members of staff as well. And we're looking to uh, make wider use of um, professional courses that are becoming available um, in the coming months and years. Um, and we also, as I've said there, promote the, um, the scheme, the apprenticeship scheme to a number of schools in the, um, the local area, although they've obviously, this has obviously been on hold in the, um, in the last um, six, eight months. Um, and just lastly, we've provided some feedback from some of our former apprentices, um, which highlight the positive experiences they've had from the scheme. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Joe. I think, um, yeah, just some, some incredible investment in young people there and, and some real successes. 
do, do you have the the actual figures for those that have been have been able to go on and, and find uh, work within H NHDC or actually outside of NHDC? So what what's the kind of what next for the apprentices in and that data? Well, the um, the information that I've got that I totted up um, quite recently was we've we've had about. 40 that have completed so we've obviously got um, nine at the moment that are still on the apprenticeship scheme but of the 40 that have completed 24 went on to stay um, for a length of time including um, some that some that we've detailed in the um, in the report so I think we've kind of given four recent examples that have graduated so to speak and stayed with us um, and then about another 10 or 12 I think that are existing members so the sort of the difference between the two will be people that maybe stayed for um, a year or two or maybe into a permanent job but have, sin have since moved on mm -hmm. um, and sometimes obviously they take the advantage of, um, of staying on in a perhaps in a if a vacancy comes up in their own department um, but we've also had some success where people have um, moved departments um, for example one of our um, first HR apprentices moved into a project support role um, after leaving HR um, and then moved into um, an operations role in um, in and when we first set up the town hall um so you know he had to kind of a couple of career moves and has since um left the council to go on to um, further his career elsewhere brilliant so some good some good follow-on stories as well uh, uh terry bless you <laughs> you look like you're feeling very under the weather and thank you for remaining muted for that um uh, one last question for me on apprentices uh, is around their studies and uh kind of success there do you and, and sorry joe i'm throwing this on you and if you don't have the data that's fine um, but i was just wondering if we'd had any that had required extra support with their studies or perhaps come into you know had, had realized that this wasn't what they wanted to do um have we had many instances of that instances where they haven't completed the the course you mean or just that they've yeah. struggled to complete it right. I, think, I think we yeah i think we've, we've had a couple we um you know it's Obviously, we we like them to stay and complete the um, the apprenticeship and complete their qualification, but it's not always for everyone. So there is a there is a, a small dropout rate, and I think um think certainly um you know we we always do our best. We've got um the Ellen um employing learning and employee engagement team that will um regularly keep keep in touch with all of our apprentices to make sure that they're getting on okay. Um, checking in with managers, checking with their assessors and things as well. So I think those that those that are motivated and it feels like it's the right fit for them. And obviously we hope that when we select them, it's the right thing. But, you know, circumstances change from time to time. But yeah, in the main, I think they get a good level of support from the managers and from the um, L&D team, um, which means they're successful in completing the qualification. Brilliant. And um, sorry, I said that was the last one, but I've got another one because I love this topic. Um, so the, the, you said that the managers that were were uh, the, kind of talking about or were highlighting the benefits of having a, or enjoying the benefits of having an apprentice in the team. Are you finding that diversity is is particularly helpful for the whole workforce? Is there, are there any examples of that where having an apprentice around is actually you know been been particularly different than had we not had that level of diversity in the team I can't think of a specific example if I'm honest but I think I, I think obviously having younger members of the team kind of sometimes bring different newer ideas I guess um I guess in, in the HR team, for example, we've we've had sort of younger people that have perhaps been um, more savvy tech savvy and you know maybe talk to us about how they've applied for jobs and it's made us look at different approaches to recruitment use it more use of social media that kind of thing would be an example I suppose so I think um yeah I think there's lots of benefits but yeah nothing specific like springs to mind I don't know if um, Anthony or um, Ian have got any examples uh, Anthony, um, I haven't necessarily got a specific example but just wanted to make the general point that it's been really good from the point of view of succession planning um you only have to look at the sort of demographic breakdown of our workforce to know we, quite, we have quite a lot in the 50 plus uh, age range who are obviously hugely valued a number of them have been with us for a long long time um, but obviously the, the issue is if they all decide to retire at once you then you, you've lost a huge amount of experience and knowledge there and actually bringing these younger people into the organization we've had a lot of success stories of them staying well, that helps us train up the next generation. Um, 
hopefully find opportunities for them to progress within the council. And for some, um, and um, Joe gave the example of one of our first apprentices, he's gone on to some really great things outside of the council. Uh, I link with him on LinkedIn, so I get to see what he's up to. And, and it's just a real success story that the individual and sort of the community as a whole has benefited, even if the council hasn't directly, if they've moved on. But from a sort of wider, greater good point of view, it's been a fantastic scheme all around. Mm, brilliant. Any other questions or comments on, on the apprenticeship report? Okay, I've got no hands up. So just a, a thank you on that, and Joe. And and you're now going to come on to agenda item eight. I think that's the same with you again. And it's about carers at work. Okay, yeah. So this was the um the discussion topic that was chosen last time, wasn't it? Yeah. Again, I should maybe just pull out a few of the key points really. Obviously, the um the last year with the various restrictions that have been in place um have sort of really brought to the fore the, uh, the sort of caring responsibilities of some of our staff. Um, particularly in early in lockdown, where we know that when schools were closed, um, there was a juggling act going on for sort of working parents having to help um, with homeschooling alongside um, their normal duties and so on. In the paper, we've defined or given a definition of carers. So it obviously just in, doesn't just include those with children, but those that may be caring for adults, um, often a partner or an elderly parent. Um, at the council, we do know that um, many of our staff are carers, although we don't have any specific um, data on this. The facts that we've listed in the um, in the report show that you know there are a large number of carers in the UK, and it's you know it's an important role that they play in providing that care. Often alongside other responsibilities, it, you know the, jug work, the, the um, juggling of work and caring responsibilities can be um, very physically tiring, but also can be quite stressful for some kind of made the point there that you know with an aging population as well as a, a rise in the state pension age it is likely that more people of working age will become carers in the future and obviously for us as employers it's important that we support this group of people as well as to retain their skills and experience and um, I'm pleased to say that at North Heart we already provide support and um, which will be you know benefit to staff with caring responsibilities such as flexible working so obviously includes the opportunity to um, to take part time hours and also compressed hours. Um, we've got a good flexi time scheme, which I know lots of people benefit from, um, as well as obviously the home working, which we've had in place um, for many years, not just in the last 12 months. Um, working parents are also able to access leave such as maternity and paternity, as well as the statutory parental leave and also shared parental leave sorry, yeah, and adoption leave. And then in our um, special leave policy um, and time off for dependents, there are arrangements in place there to give greater flexibility when needed as well. Um, and as we've discussed previously, um, we've got a range of support in place for staff well-being, which obviously is available for everybody, but also um, perhaps a particular benefit to some of those that um, with caring responsibilities. So occupational health and the GP helpline, the employee assistant provider, as well as, as, well as links to the um, other resources and support available via our internet pages. As a, an employer, it's great we're able to support staff in this way, um, but there's obviously benefits to the, the council as well as we re able to retain staff um, and maintain productivity as well as trying to help with um, keeping relatively low levels of sick absence, et cetera, which can be an issue in particular. Um, and I think the last point is just around the fact that there are sort of developments um, ongoing and it's something that maybe we can be looking at in the end of coming months to consider how we can further support staff with caring responsibilities. Lovely, thank you Jo. Uh, I'm going to go straight to Terry. Thank you Jo for the update. Yeah, I'm glad to see we're doing lots and lots. I don't think we can do too much of this, particularly for our employees who are our carers as well. Um, I like and perhaps you confirm that we, we are flexible and, and whilst we have rules and policies in place, as I read in your report, that of course they are, whilst they're rules, we have to be a certain amount of flexibility in what we do today with our carers because things change rapidly if you're a carer. Um, I speak for my wife on this with a 96 year old mother-in-law, but um, so things do change and therefore we have to have, and I'm sure we do have flexibility in our arrangements throughout the organisation to ensure 
that we can respond quickly to the needs of our employees who are carers. Can you confirm that for me, Joe? Yeah, absolutely. I, and I think the, you know the policies are there, so it kind of gives the structure. But certainly, um, yeah, you know, from talking to line managers about specific issues in the past, I know that you know if they feel that they need to clarify, um, you know, how much flexibility or discretion they can give, then they're you know very welcome to, to discuss that with a member of the HR team. And we would advise that yeah, where, wherever possible, we'd give you know the flexibility that's needed. Um, and I think you know that pays dividends back, doesn't it, people? feel supported um and um you know then remain re remoted and um, remain motivated in their roles and i think you know more broadly that the, the, the you know the information that we found would suggest that you know that's one of the reasons why people sometimes are feel unable to stay in their work if they haven't got flexibility with their employers so we'd much rather retain um you know that skills the skills and experience of those people um by sort of being able to be flex as, as flexible as possible wherever possible thank you Oh, uh, Claire, coming to you. Yes, it's always a difficult one because for some employees, there's, you know, the caring responsibilities they have are kind of permanent and, you know, it's a day in, day out um, if they've got a, a relative that needs that support. For others, it can just be a short term, you know, if, they, if a relative, a close relative, you know, is particularly if they need sort of that end of, what I call their end of life support, which is for a short period. Um, but I think knowing that we have staff that um, feel that they can talk to their managers about what their needs are to get that level of flexibility. Um, I think that that's that's very reassuring. I think the, you know, but on the other flip side, you know, what we've got to be clear, you know, we've got to understand is that employees can't, you know, you know, although for the short term ones, it's 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 you know, it's it's very easy because it, there's usually a time limit. It's for those that have the long term care responsibilities, and those start to increase with time. And it's how you know how that is managed, and that is, is it's a very dip, you know it's a very difficult subject. And I, I know I don't have a lot of background, but I do, the only way I see it is when you've got young carers. And again, it's the respite that those people sometimes need, because when they're trying to do all that drug juggling, it's an awful lot of additional stress that a, a single individual person mm -hmm. is then under, and then it's then that then kicks into sort of the the mental. Um, difficulties that people have as well you know it's a very very difficult subject um, I and mean, again I think the biggest issue is about people talking about it and communicating mm. good insights there Claire I think yeah you're absolutely right aren't you but it, it, and, and as the report I thought highlighted really well caring is so multi-dimensional there it, it it you know it it's parents it's children it's relatives it's you know whoever you may be caring for um so yeah i think uh, i'm heartened to see the, the degree of flexibility and i think i think you make a good point claire it's about communication and uh, when something does become longer term understanding how you can work out what's right for everyone um, it's getting it's knowing that you know it's, it's having those sort of plans i think one thing what one one does see that because people can can all work remotely really um, and I know in my own circumstances, for me, it was I could just upstick, take my laptop and go and move in with my, with my elderly mother. Well, I actually did it very often. But uh, it, was a, it was an option I could do because I could work from her house just as easily as I could work from home from my home or go into an office. And it's just but it's, it's understanding or, you know, managers understanding that's where their employees are. Don't expect to necessarily find them always at home. If they've needed to go to round to somebody else's house to work, that's just as acceptable. Mm. Mm. That flexibility that we can offer. I actually conducted an interview yesterday and and had a singing lesson going on upstairs that was that was very audible, <laughs> um, and and yeah, there's a caring responsibility and and just that openness and, and adapting to other people's working circumstances. I think has been a the story of 2020, which perhaps might help this this population too. Uh, Martin, you put your hand up. Yeah, it's, this is a very interesting discussion, very important area. Um, I, I was really just going to comment that, of course, we talked earlier about those departments that are under extreme stress at any particular time. And of course, that's compounded when, when there are members who've got caring responsibilities. And I think one of the real concerns is that uh, people who are carers often 
work far beyond the call of duty in terms of their caring as well as their work for the council. And there is this real issue about uh, making sure that people have that respite, as Claire mentioned, um, from caring and from the council duties to, for their own well-being. So uh, I think it's, you know, I'm really pleased that we've had this discussion. Uh, and yes, that the, the, uh, uh, what we're doing it, it looks excellent, but uh, you know, it's something we need to be continually aware of in, in terms of um, being aware of those responsibilities. And in a sense, uh, as, Claire, as Claire said, um, if you've got caring responsibilities working from home, it's apparently a lot easier, but the, the stress can be that much greater. Mm. Indeed. Any other questions or comments on this topic? I'm, um, I'm keen to, for, for this committee to, to have this conversation again, Joe, when the Carers Action Plan is, is more fully formed and kind of implications and usefulness um, is, is better known. I think it would be good to kind of bring that to the fore again. Um, it feels as though NHDC are doing, a, doing an awful lot and, and doing it very sensibly and conscientiously. Um, and it would be good to know if there is anything else out there that, that in terms of benchmarking for how we can further assist people in this, in this position. So yeah, it'd be good to bring that back when, when more information on that's known. Um, one question, um, which also relates to the previous topic as well, around kind of what this year has meant for people who are in this category. And I ask it about apprentices too, because in, in my other job, I've certainly found that apprentices are finding working from home harder than any other population, because they're generally the ones that live with their parents or siblings. They're finding space in the home very difficult. Um, and, and, it, and it's a challenge. And I think as Martin alluded to, and, and working from home can be wonderful for carers, but it can also put additional pressure on them, particularly this year, other support in the home has been far less available. So I just, I just wondered if, if kind of off the top of your head, Joe, sorry to keep quizzing you, um, if you were dealing with any significant issues in that regard and what you were doing about them. Um, I wouldn't say significant. I think we are conscious that, as you say, there are young people, um, younger members of staff that might be working, um, well, will be working from home at the moment that perhaps have been used to being in the office. Um, and perhaps if they're yeah in their in their bedroom at their parents' house, then they're you know pretty much in the, the same four walls for a, a lot of the, the day and the night, I guess. And um, I think that can be obviously quite difficult. Um, I think where we've been able to, and it's been picked up, and you know, I'm aware of um, managers arranging to have kind of one to ones, walking one to ones, meeting up for a, you know an outdoor coffee or a you know chat on a park bench or whatever. Um, so that you know, there's a bit of face-to-face -face contact, which um, obviously is lacking at the moment for all of us. Um, so I think we've, we've picked up on those kind of things. Um, we also trialled something last week, actually we've got a couple of members of the, of the team um, in HR at the moment, there were apprentices that are now on um, temporary contracts with us supporting the maternity cover arrangements in place. But we, um, I think we were kind of conscious that we would, we would try something a bit different. So instead of, um, being able to work in the office together on Friday, which obviously we're none of us done for a very long time now, we had an open Zoom call. Um, so it's kind of like this, but we were just all working, but it kind of felt like the same as when you're in the office where you can kind of just sort of lift your head up and say, oh, did you see that email about such and such? Or, or can I just ask you about, which is the kind of conversation that you don't have when you're in your house working on your own, but it kind of just created a bit more of a, a team thing. We, we really liked it. There were those that were involved in it on Friday and I think we'll we'll try and do that on a, a more regular basis. And I think maybe share that as an experience across the other teams and things. But certainly I think that kind of general interaction is what's what yeah. some people are doing, isn't it? So um, kind of ask the questions that you wouldn't necessarily write an email about or pick up the phone for, but actually, you know, having sort of a bit more social contact and things has, um, has been good. Brilliant. I think that, that's very clever. <laughs> um, Dee, uh, you have your hand up. Uh, I'll come to you after Dee, Claire. So Dee, if you want to unmute. Trying to. Trying to. It's all right, you're there. Okay. <laughs> um, the um, staff consultation last, last week, was it, Ian? Um, 
it was brought up about people perhaps finding it hard working from home long term. And um, I'm sure Ian said to talk to managers and see, you know, if people are finding it too difficult to see if they could perhaps come in and work part time in the offices, that there was enough space to be able to do that now. Uh, Ian, do you want to respond to that? Yes, I did. And it is true. Uh, the case in my team uh, this week around someone who's now coming in a couple of days a week just because working at home is not working for them. Um, and yeah, there's other examples as well where you know, we obviously try and limit the number of people in the office, but where there's a sort of a well-being need or just a practical need that overrides that, we will we'll find space for them. Um, so yeah, we we are list we are, we are encouraging managers to talk to their to talk to their staff, and I think that's a big positive from this year is that I think managers are talking to their staff more, and that is obviously key both now and going forward. It's a mm. great advice that's come out of it, uh, and those conversations are happening and, and results are happening are coming out of that. Mm. That's a really good point. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, thanks, uh, Claire. Claire Strong. Yeah, thank you. We seem to have sort of strayed off the agenda item, but I love the I love that idea of the um, the open office sort of having a time. And what I wanted, I thought was really, I thought was a great idea. Um, but and what I wondered is, are there have there are there any sort of Christmas drinky virtual meeting things with bring your own mince pie going on for employees? I mean, they it, you know, just as a bit of a social social thing. And I'm sorry, it's not on the, the on the part of this agenda topic. But I mean, is something like that happening within all the groups? You can always talk about Christmas drinks, Claire. Um, <laughs> I know, you're, I know you're always, 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 always at the <laughs> forefront of my memory. It's terrible, isn't it? But I mean, are they having sort of bring, you know, in the week before bring around mince pie? So, so in, individual teams are obviously able to do their own thing. Uh, yesterday, we had an all-staff briefing, which was um, wear your Christmas jumper and donate to save the children. Uh, and we followed it with Steve Crowley doing a magic show for the staff. So um, that, that's the sort of example of, of what we did um, yesterday uh, in terms of Christmas drinks, uh, not a sort of sort of um, council wide one, uh, nothing planned at the moment. But I know individual teams are, are doing little bits and pieces. Oh, thank you. It's just it's sort of kind of good to hear that. I'm sorry I missed the magic show. Can I put that on record now, please don't. It was really good. Video, really good. video, video. <laughs> video. <laughs> um, go, go on his uh, Facebook and Instagram, Steve Crowley, close-up magician. Right, okay. He's, he's available for hire. <laughs> Wonderful, okay, thank you. Um, and thank you, Joe, for, for uh, letting me quiz you on all that stuff. Um, unless there are any other questions and comments, Claire, take it as a legacy hand that I could see there. Um, Oh, yeah, okay. So we'll move on now then to agenda item nine, which is the strategic discussion topics with some suggested items. Having read through that, did, did, have, has, have any of you got any questions or any thoughts or comments on what a good discussion topic might be uh, coming up? Sorry, I didn't even look at my screen. <laughs> I was expecting to hear someone say. Uh, let's go to Keith first. Hi, yeah, thanks. Um, I, I'm looking at salary sacrifice schemes, what we have and what's their popularity. It'd be quite nice to get an update on that. And have we seen any sort of decline in their popularity given the current working conditions? Thank you. Uh, Martin. Um, I was looking at the challenges and rewards of long term home working. I think that's something we will need to discuss um, whether the next meeting is the right one. But certainly within the next um, couple of meetings, we really ought to have a, a really good look at that one. Yeah, I agree on that. Um, Anthony, you got your finger. <laughs> I was going to say the flip side to that for well, probably the summer is actually supporting people getting back to working in the office um, because mm. having been at home for well potentially 18 months or so at that point it is going to be a bit of a culture shock and we do need to think through how we support that um, so I think there's there's sort of two sides to that coin. 
Yeah, there's, there, yeah. I think there's a number of facets, and, and uh, certainly in the briefing yesterday, uh, we talked about some things that we may need to just keep our eye on um, when we think about 2021 and get and getting offices back back to work. Um, and and I did ask yesterday, and we agreed, I think it's a group, that there would be um, on upcoming meetings a verbal update on kind of where we're at with the people recovery plan, people slash COVID recovery plan, the people aspect of the COVID recovery plan, because I think um, uh, what we have learned is that a paper written three weeks prior to a meeting is is you know it could be largely irrelevant particularly in the world of, of employment legislation and hr um, and um, i don't see the first half of next year being too different in that regard so i think verbal update on that would be wonderful and it it feels as though we need to understand the right time to have that conversation uh, i think there may well be other facets to that conversation that we couldn't predict right now um, to, towards getting lots of people together. So um, if everybody is in agreement then, I think if we put down for the next meeting a verbal update on the people aspect of COVID and also the salary sacrifice um, in light of kind of where we're at. And then the meeting after that, if we were able to discuss this uh, uh, rewards and challenges of home working slash bringing people back to the office and what does that mean? Uh, is everybody in agreement with that? Yeah. Brilliant. Okay, some thumbs up. Um, all right. I think that is everything, yeah, that we've got on the agenda to discuss. And look at that. Good timing. Um, is, has anybody else got anything else that they want to say to anyone about anything? <laughs> Christmas drinks, mince pies. Uh, well, I would like to say uh, what a year it's been, and certainly I know that the JSCC is, um, it, it covers all aspects of, of the council's work uh, in regard to people, but clearly uh, the work that we discuss here is, is a, a lot of it comes from the, the HR team, and it's been an incredible year, you know, with, with lots of things going on, not to mention some key uh, changes in the workforce there as well in the team. And so, um, yeah, just huge congratulations and admiration from, from me um, uh, and I'm sure this, the rest of this committee for the work that you've done and for looking after people so well and, and for getting people through this year. It's been absolutely incredible. And uh, yeah, I'd just like to say thank you. Well done and have a wonderful Christmas, everybody. Thank you. Okay, and with that, I can close the meeting. Thank you, Chair.